My name, um, welcome everybody. My name is Marty Mascari, and I'm with an, uh, a contractor with the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging and the North Central Texas Aging and Disability Resource Center, or ADRC, uh, both of which are under the umbrella of the North Central Texas Council of Governments in the greater Dallas Fort Worth, Texas area. And we are blessed once again to have our partners at Heyman Home here to talk to us. Um, um, about addiction in the family, and they brought a guest with them as well um, from another firm. And I'm going to let Sheila first talk about CEUs, and then I'm going to let Sheila, if you would, do your introductions. We'll be happy to. Okay, today um, we are offering CEUs for any type of social work um, and for any type of counselors. Now there's a lot of acronyms and not all of them do I know, but LPC and LCDC and MFT are three that I know that would benefit from this tremendously, as well as any type of social worker. But um, if you heard me earlier, I did not submit this one for a CLE for attorneys. And there's a reason why there's not a ton of legal work in this or legal you know what I mean, that I did not personally didn't think that the, the Texas bar would approve it. And that's why I did not. Now that won't be true going forward. I will do that, but not today. Um, anyway, so it's mostly social workers and um, uh, counselors of any sort. Now, here's what you do, which you're used to doing anyway. You're going to get two forms from Marty when he does the follow-up, and they will be the sign-in sheet and the eval form. Simply return those to me, Sheila at HeymanHogue.com, and then I will send you a certificate. Just that simple. Nice. Um, and, and I apologize. It, it was really me that, um, that, that, that made the assumption and made the mistake about the CLEs, and I certainly apologize. Uh, to well, all I of didn't you. tell you. So I know, that's not your it, fault. I didn't tell you. It, it's, it's just fine, but I had it on the flyer. I put it on the flyer. So, so I apologize, but we want to make sure you know up front before we get started that that there's not, you know, this one does not qualify for the CLEs. Um, in addition to the information for Sheila, there's also um, a, um, a Zoom, I'm sorry, a Google survey that should pop up um, at the end of the webinar today. And um, we asked you to fill that out, uh, that survey out. That helps us report back on our goals and objectives we set forth when we applied for our funding to put this these webinars on. And, and I appreciate your chat. I will, in just a second, I have a link for the slides and I will put them in the chat here in just a second. And Sheila, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to um, to introduce Rex and, it, is it? R Rana. 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 Rana, I'm so sorry. That's um, okay, um, it's and, a funky name. Our, our, um, <laughs> our introductions for us, that would be great. And I apologize. Okay, the school chums today, <laughs> Rana and Rex, are going to talk to you about addiction in the family. Rana is she does work for a uh, a law firm. She, as a matter of fact, Rana goes to court with the law firm to testify. But Rana herself is a licensed social worker as well as a licensed LPC and LCDC. So she has, she can approach this from all of these angles. And that's why I wanted her specifically on this because she can help you in ways that we can't. So um, I, I just felt like it was perfect for this particular one. Now, Rex, you know, is a founding partner of Heyman Hogue. And um, actually, Rex has experienced addiction in, a, uh, in a, an extended family member, but also in our office. So because of my son. So he's experienced it in a lot of ways and had multiple experiences with clients with addiction in their family. And so that's why he brings his experience to this as well. So without any further ado, we're going to have Miss Rana start us off. Thank you. What an honor to be here. I appreciate being invited to uh, participate in this. And just a Rana, little bit. If you that, could speak, if you could speak up just up, a bit. Okay. Is that Thank better? <laughs> Um, just a little bit of background. I was in private practice for over 30 years as an LPC uh, and LCDC and did a lot of family court work, uh, custody evaluations and substance abuse evaluations. I was also in the criminal courts as well. And uh, I was uh, 
the original clinician for the Denton County Veterans Treatment Court. And then I was also the original clinician for the uh, Denton County DWI Repeat Offender Court. So this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And uh, I guess even uh, as recently as yesterday, uh, I found out that a uh, defense attorney in Denton that I've known for years committed suicide the day before. And he was deep in addiction. People knew it. There had been a lot of help offered him and it just, um, I don't know if it was too little, too late, but this is something that impacts all of us to one degree or another. So I wanted to talk about this in the family. And there's so much material out there. Um, this could go on forever. And I chose a very small amount of information to put together because I knew I was going to be presenting with an attorney and attorneys always have a lot of information. So um, let's see. Can we go to that next slide? Yeah, thank you. Um, let, you control? No, because I'll, I'll okay. end up doing something. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so <clears throat> I thought we should start off with a basic definition uh, so that we're all kind of all on the same page of what is addiction. It's a chronic unrestrained obsession with and pursuit of, <clears throat> excuse me, a substance or an event or an activity that consistently leads to changes in brain chemistry, behavior, and emotions. And that's whether it's a substance or an event or an activity, that brain chemistry still <clears throat> changes. Okay. So some common elements, <clears throat> common elements, people use or pursue those activities, uh, events to feel quote unquote normal. Whenever someone first uses something, whether it's alcohol, a, uh, another substance, whatever, and that uh, feeling kicks in, the rest of that person's life, they are chasing that original high. They're never able to achieve it, but they're always chasing it. Um, there's preoccupation with the behavior. As the addiction cycle moves on, it's, okay, so if I go to this party, will there be people who are using there? Um, how can I go uh, on my way home and get whatever I want so that when I get home, I can have it? It's a lot of involvement in the thinking. And I apologize if, if there's questions or things that pop up uh, from the audience, I can't see that far. And so uh, just interrupt me and let me know if there's something I need to address. We, we, will, we will give you time at the end for, for okay. questions. Okay, okay, good. I can't see that. Um, temporary satiation. In other words, somebody uses or experiences uh, the activity or the event or the substance, and for the moment, all is well, and they're satisfied. But that temporary satisfaction gets shorter and shorter and shorter, meaning that they have to use more and more and more, thus leading eventually to a loss of control. They go out and they say, okay, I'm going to have two beers. That they're well intended. At the end of the night, they realize they've had 12. They spent way more money than they ever intended to. And it's now they've lost control and then eventually negative consequences. And these common elements we'll be talking about all the way through um, my presentation. But the negative consequences start off pretty small. They are hungover. They don't feel great. Or um, maybe they said something that they don't remember or that uh, they knew they shouldn't have the next day or whatever. Those are consequences, but they're small in comparison to the ones that as the cycle progresses, how those consequences just exponentially continue to grow. Uh, consistent factors of the addiction cycle is there's a compulsion. I must, a craving. I need it, I want it. I've used the example before of going into a bakery and maybe prior to walking in, 
you didn't really uh, feel like you had to have something. You walk in and you smell that stuff, and you see that stuff, and it's all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I want 10 of those and four of those, and you just go crazy. And that's what it's like in addiction, because it's a constant mouth-watering type of event. Uh, there's a saying in, in uh, AA or the uh, addiction community where uh, a thousand is too many and one, one is not, one is too many, a thousand is not enough. Sorry, I got that backwards. One is too many and a thousand is not enough because it just continues to escalate and consume the person. Again, where there's consequences that uh, continue to infilter <clears throat> various stages and areas of that person's life, and they end up having a hard time reeling it back in, thus they're out of control. And that is consistent over uh, addiction to whether it's alcohol, various substances, gambling, pornography, these factors uh, are very much a part of each one of those uh, maladies. Okay, so what are some of the stages? And I've gone back in my notes and kind of changed some of these and added them, but I've added uh, or combined denial and overreaction because when somebody is uh, confronted about, hey, you drank too much last night, or you spent too much money, uh, you know, at the at the slot machine or whatever. It's no, I didn't. You are always uh, lecturing me or or getting on to me, or you always think the worst of me, and the addict will end up overreacting and. Uh, coming out saying, that's not me, uh, I'm tired of you attacking me, and it becomes where they uh, shut down. They, uh, they become avoidant and defensive, and it's, I don't want to talk to you if you're going to talk to me about, you think I have a problem, so I'm just going to avoid you altogether. Again, they become defensive. Catastrophizing is related to, that's the only way I can have fun. The only way I can enjoy uh, this party, it's the only way I can tolerate my family or my outlaws or whoever, is that uh, catastrophizing of I can't do it without my best friend. My best friend is whatever this substance or activity is. Social and emotional paralysis and tunnel vision really should all go together. And that is where again, I can't react or I can't engage with this person or this activity or um, this without, without my friend. And that emotional paralysis, addiction invariably paralyzes people's emotions. They become withdrawn, they become shut down, um, even if they're the life of the party or if they uh, seem to be this happy-go-lucky person, inside they're dead or they are dying. And I've always uh, said when I was working in the field more, uh, more front lines type that addiction is a process of isolation and recovery is a process of community. And addicts resist that community because that means exposure that feels like i'm going to be found out people are going to know what i'm doing what i've been doing um, how i really feel and i don't want to do that that doesn't sound fun to me i'm all about fun so uh let's see where we're we? um the justifying continued use well Everybody does it. Everybody, uh, you know, drinking is the, the socially accepted thing, 
And so just because I may do it a little bit more than somebody else, um, everybody does it more than they should on occasion. Or, uh, you know, if you had my husband, you would use too. Or uh, there's just so many ways to, I can't, you know, if you want me to work all these hours, then this is what I've got to do. So just leave me alone. And these stages, sometimes they're very short in duration. Sometimes they're long. But invariably, these stages are what are uh, experienced. Nothing gets skipped in this uh, process. So who are addicts? The people on here, um, all ages, colors, demographics, uh, next one, please. Um, how many of you all, I'm sure, have had either a friend or a family member that has struggled with addiction? And you hear people all the time say, they've got all the money in the world. Why? They should be happy. Why are they using? Or, uh, you know, they're, they're so, uh, they've got it all together. They've got this great family. They've got all these people who love them and they're so successful. There is not one sector of the human race that's untouched by this affliction. The rich, the poor, the middle class. All colors, male, female, all socioeconomic groups, the gifted and talented, the intellectually challenged, the famous, the unknown, the old, and my favorite, the good kids, whatever that is, um, the bad kids, whatever that is. Um, one of my sons is a, a juvenile probation officer, and he is always saying, but mom, you know, he was a good kid, and then he came in here for whatever the kid had done. And I said, but how do you define good kids and bad kids? Because all kids make some good decisions. All kids make some bad decisions. That's human nature. And so um, when we're looking at kids like that, uh, it touches, uh, addiction touches all <clears throat> kids. Uh, all types of kids, um, rather. Athletes, clearly. Uh, a lot of professional athletes have struggled big time in this arena. Sometimes I think it's because they have so much money at their disposal and uh, either so little wisdom or so little guidance as to what to do with that and how to make some good life decisions. Okay, so what, how does addiction impact a family? Obviously, it's going to impact every family differently uh, on some levels, but then underneath it, there's going to be these very common threads, the fear. You know, you wonder what's going on. Is my kid out doing something tonight? Or is my parent out doing something tonight? Um, and then the anger. I can't believe I raised you better than that. How dare you uh, do something so stupid? Uh, confusion. Again, distrust. No, I can't trust you. I can't trust you to stay and watch our child because last time I did, you know, you put him in the car and you drove drunk. And I cannot trust you. That builds a lot of resentment. When I was working in the, the specialty courts in Denton, um, obviously they were uh, criminal courts. The people in there were had criminal offenses, but they all had families, and a lot of them were in family court as well, uh, working on uh, custody matters and things like that. And addiction, when it's when family court uh, has pe has people that have addiction issues, it really makes things even so much more difficult for the parties, the attorneys, and the judge to try to navigate as to what's in the best interest of those children. 
and the resentment that's built uh, in these homes just uh, grows uh, out of control. Broken relationships. Obviously, I work for a uh, family law firm, and one of the reasons that our law firm is so passionate about helping families uh, in litigation with addiction is uh, our owner and managing partner is very open about his own recovery and his pursuit of um, abstinence and you know, healthy living. And so he's very passionate about our firm helping people who are in family litigation with these specific issues. There's rage. Talk about domestic violence. We did a webinar last month uh, specifically on domestic violence and all the um, all the nuances of how that impacts uh, family law matters. And substance abuse is such a, an integral part of domestic violence. Not always across the board, but it is a huge factor in how uh, domestic violence will get started and uh, continue. Um, the forced facade where we got to put on our uh, Stepford wives, you know, smiles and everybody make it look uh, like we're happy and we're going to go take family photos and behind the door, uh, you know, there's fighting and cussing and breaking things and uh, all kinds of, of dysfunction due to a lot of times the addiction or the, the misuse of substances. Financial crisis. I can't tell you how many cases I've been involved in where there was a pretty large estate to begin with, whether they inherited it uh, or they made it themselves, but it's dwindling fast because somebody is using a lot of that money for their drug of choice, whether again, that's uh, gambling, drugs, alcohol, pornography, whatever their drug of choice is, um, that money can be eaten up quite rapidly. Divorce, obviously. Um, Addiction in the family can create, can contribute definitely to divorce. Poor health. I mean, so many uh, health situations are related to substance use, whether it's they've drank all their life or the, the opiate crisis. We talk about legitimately starting because somebody has had uh, injuries or surgeries or uh, whatever, whatever the original uh, legit use was, but now it has morphed into something that is uncontrollable, and uh, then therefore their health is no longer uh, just a, a side thing. It's it's now the uh, presenting issue. Obviously, police and CPS involvement, where uh, the cops are called, the uh, there's DWIs, there's arrests, there's possession charges, there's there's all those things where if there had not been the misuse of substances, this likely would not have occurred for these uh, agencies to have to get involved. Jail. I can't tell you how many jail visits I've done, jail evaluations, uh, and they're in there. So many people are jailed because of substance use, whether that was actually the presenting deal or they're in there because they uh, broke in and stole something because they were going to pawn it to uh, use for drugs. Uh, the attorney that I spoke about at the very beginning of this, he was actually on DWI probation. It was a misdemeanor. Um, however, I think he started that probation like two years ago, and in the last year and a half or whatever, they kept 
giving him sanctions because of his violation. He could not stop drinking. And he was about to have a uh, another hearing where they were going to increase his treatment level and increase his can't hear me. Is that me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, and so he, he, they were increasing his sanctions and his treatment level. And I'm wondering if eventually that just got to him and he couldn't stop drinking. And he said, forget it. And he ended up killing himself. Okay, children. I have another son who was a CPS investigator for several years and um, would tell some horrendous stories. So he's now a church youth minister, and I'm sure he could still tell some horrendous stories, but <laughs> at least he's out of the CPS world. Um, effects on children. So what happens when one or both parents or caregivers, could be grandparents, whoever, um, are in a family where this is the quote unquote norm. If the child is young enough, when the caregiver is uh, in their addiction, there can be disrupted attachment because a very young child should be able to trust and know that that person is gonna be there to meet their needs, to feed them, to put the roof over their head, to pick them up when they cry, whatever. And when that doesn't happen because addiction has stepped in, then that child uh, is not as able to attach to that caregiver. And therefore, as they grow up, they don't trust anybody or they over attach to people very quickly. Um, as the children age and get older, there's role reversal. And so a five-year-old will uh, see that mom is passed out drunk again. So she may take the, the mom's keys and hide them so mom can't go anywhere just to make sure because she, the little five-year-old remembers last week when mom was passed out and got up and drove to the store uh, and put her in the car and scared her to death. So this child is now taking care of the parent. Um, may, you know, a little older child may call mom's boss and say, I'm sorry, my mom is sick. She's not gonna be able to come in today when mom's really so hung over, she can't get out of bed. And, you know, they'll take their, their babysitting money or their dog walking money and they'll give it to dad so he can pay the light bill or whatever. There's a lot of caretaking on the part of that child. Um, the child can develop the inability to trust. If I can't trust my parents, then how am I supposed to trust? And they love me, they're my parents. How am I supposed to trust somebody who's my teacher? They say they care about me or another adult. I don't, I can't trust them. Um, Failure in school. Obviously, this is um, in a lot of uh, ways. They could fail to go to school. They could fail to be on time to school. They could fail to have their homework or uh, to be prepared. They could end up falling asleep in class because of how they were taking care of their mom last night and they didn't get their homework done and they're exhausted, but they're there today. Um, on the flip side of that same uh, issue is overachievement. I'm going to be the best student, the best uh, student body president, the best whatever it is at school. And I'm gonna be involved in every single thing so that I don't have to go home where it's a catastrophe. And People won't be in my business asking me, so why weren't you at school today? Or why didn't you do your homework? If I'm the best and they know they can rely on me, then they're not going to be asking me a bunch of nosy questions about what's going on at my house. I'm embarrassed. 
um, go back to that facade where they feel forced to pretend. Yeah, you know, my mom couldn't come to my volleyball game last week, um, but she's going to be here this week. Mom doesn't come to the volleyball game this week. Oh, I guess she had another meeting at work when in reality, mom goes out every Thursday night and will never be at a volleyball game until things change. Um, poor or lack of supervision. I mean, children all the time are where uh, a parent is using, they're smoking and kid has to go put the cigarette out or something catches on fire. There's leftover uh, joint or something left on the, the uh, coffee table. Parents passed out, not from the joint, but from multiple things. And so the kid picks it up and says, you know what? I know, I know how to use that. I know what it is. So they start uh, using that. They pick up a leftover mixed drink after parents party. And, oh, that, that didn't taste that good, but I'm going to try it because my parents like it. And so there's all these things that as a young age, not only are these kids exposed to, but they're also uh, beginning to be curious about, obviously, and want to get involved. The premature sexual experimentation. This is across the board um, in a home where there's uh, active addiction. However, if there is cocaine or methamphetamines that are in the home or if the, the parents are using, that's an almost guarantee that you're going to have multiple sexual partners in and out of that house. And more than likely, that kid or those kiddos will have seen things they shouldn't have seen and probably been approached uh, by people sexually. Um, that's just a goes with the whole uh, coke and meth uh, usage and, and abuse. Um, and then ultimately it could be removal from the home, which, yeah, they don't need to be in a home where all that's going on, but removing kids from a home has its own set of, of uh, difficulties and, and challenges. So what are the effects on a spouse? And uh, if any of y'all have ever dealt with anybody who uh, had a spouse that was active in addiction, you can <clears throat> see they have a compulsion to lecture. You know, I told you that if you didn't uh, you know, leave the bar by 10 o'clock. You wouldn't be able to get up and go to work this morning. And uh, I can't believe you keep doing that. What happens when somebody is lecturing and nagging is they lose their audience. So they end up yelling. They end up being passive aggressive. They do all this stuff. And it's addictive thinking versus rational thinking. And it might as well be somebody speaking Japanese to somebody who speaks German. You can do sign language, you can stand on your head, but it's no comprende. Um, they attempt to monitor or control. Okay, here's $100. Yes, you can go uh, play poker, but that's it. Well, that person's going to find way more money if they want to do that. But the spouse is trying to control the situation to control their use or their activity. But the spouse in a uh, continuous detective. And who was it? Columbo, you know, who's always going around looking for trying to figure out. And that's what happens. Uh, there's mood swings. Sometimes the, the spouse is very happy because husband came home and he was sober and he was all nice. Then spouse comes home not sober, and wife gets very upset. She's pissed, depressed, all those things. How am I doing on time? Getting close. Okay, I'm getting close. Okay, I better hurry. Um, so there's distrust and distance. They begin to hide finances, uh, live in fear, and walk on eggshells. And then there's that unfounded belief 
that you caused it, you can control it, you can cure it, which is all false. Effects on parents. If they have a, a child, whether a child at home or an adult child that's using intense guilt, uh, a lot of wild vacillation in their responses, enabling, refusing to help, I'll bail you out, no, I'm not giving you another dime, significant conflict between the parents, financial hardship, and unfounded belief that you can cause it, that you caused it, you can control it, you can cure it. Okay, I did well. So uh, this, again, is just the tip of the iceberg of what <clears throat> information is out there. But just to know that there's no shame in getting help. And if there, uh, there are dire consequences for not getting help. I put my phone number on there. And if you need resources, if there's anything I can do to help with a situation, please give me a call. Um, because I'll, I'm absolutely willing to help. But also, if there's anybody out there with litigation issues in the family realm, uh, Scroggins Law Group, where I'm the litigation consultant, uh, we have fabulous lawyers who work uh, with families in this situation. So thank you. Okay, well, my part will be uh, different. Um, addiction in the family, how it affects care and planning. I'm going to start with just basically the kinds of issues that we deal with. Uh, there are three, what we call the planning dragons. Administrative dragons have to do with power of attorney failures, guardianship, probate, medical documents, um, big ugly green dragon that walks around on the ground and everybody's gonna meet this dragon at one point. Then there are taxes and there's several different kinds of taxes. Um, this is the scariest dragon to a lot of people. It's dealing with the IRS, which a lot of people think stands for I'm really scared. Um, <laughs> And then there's predator and creditor dragons, protecting yourself and protecting what you leave others. And a lot of people think this dragon just comes flying out of the air. Um, well, <clears throat> identifying the problem, uh, the percent of people in recovery, uh, there's a lot of uh, repeat uh, problems and we're going to talk about some case studies and we're going to talk about some solutions. Um, there can be a lot of different types of addicts and what I'm really going to focus on is a person dependent on drugs or alcohol. Those addictive behaviors are harmful both to the addict and to those around them. And that's their family members, their friends, their parents, um, people they hang out with. Care and planning strategies, we're going to talk about those and how you deal with it. Uh, and that can include gambling or sex. Um, there's several faces of addiction, and I'm just going to walk you through four of them. One is the lost soul. Uh, Joe, he's given up. He's hopeless. He feels forgotten. He's a chronic backslider. He's, he's just lost all hope and more or less become a derelict. Um, he steals from his family. He's got a criminal record, frequently incarcerated. He's frequently homeless, uh, often threatening, abusive, and he's actually dangerous. Um, he's both mentally and emotionally ill. Then there's the newborn. Um, you know, Sally recently sober for the first time. She's attending meetings or aftercare. She has a sponsor. And she's what we call on a pink cloud. Um, life is looking up for her. <clears throat> then there's the dry drunk. Um, you know, Bobby's story, he's not using anymore, but he's still emotionally out of sorts. He's got frequent mood changes. He's irritable and just unhappy generally. Uh, he stopped going to meetings or he infrequently goes to meeting, he stopped working with this sponsor. Um, that's fairly common. He might not be using, but his life still disrupted his life. 
Then there's the happy trudger like Janice. Uh, she's actively participating in her recovery, working the program. She's got a consistent period of sobriety or drug-free stretching months or even years. Uh, she's got steady employment. She's working with others in recovery. She's in therapy and she's happy, joyous, and free. <clears throat> um, but trauma and future addiction, childhood and teenage traumas that manifest themselves later as addictions. And that can happen to star athletes, musicians, or actors. It can happen when um, there's trauma, and I'll share one with you. Um, Ruthie was eight years old when she was raped by a soldier on a military base. And unfortunately, she had all kinds of problems. Um, and she got a settlement from the U.S. government. <clears throat> um, and it was sad to see what happened in this case. And I actually testified in a lawsuit she brought against the lawyer who got her the money. Um, and it was sad to see how she basically destroyed the settlement. And by the time she was in her mid twenties, all the money that should have taken care of her for a long time was gone. Um, you know, Michelle, uh, basically her grandparents left her a $1 million UGMA account, uh, left it to her when she was eight. Well, <clears throat> when she was 11, she went over to a friend's house one night and the parents introduced her to drugs and she was in and out of drug rehab um, for years. And, you know, ultimately she was, uh, when she got control of that money, she, she blew a lot of it on drugs and very sad story. Um, there can also be trauma that causes future addiction, like injuries and in an accident of some kind. Um, you see here a young man who lost his leg in an accident, and he was trying to help a stranded motorist, and he got hit. Well, Charlie became addicted uh, to various kinds of painkillers and then moved on to other drugs and uh, spent several years just in in and out of being on drugs. Then there's addiction in the workplace. Um, Rob was an attorney who he had a drinking problem or maybe he didn't have a drinking problem. He had no trouble with drinking at all, um, <laughs> as the song says. But he, as a boss, he was a terrible boss. He was a terrible partner and he wouldn't have been a very good employee. Um, huge liability risk for owners if he's just an employee. Um, <clears throat> and this is kind of personal to me because this concerned a former partner of mine. Unreliable work, theft, poor treatment of staff, poor treatment of clients, unexplained disappearances. And it was very frustrating being in that. Um, and having to go through that. Um, then this did not happen to my partner, but it happened to someone else I knew. Um, sudden death without planning, and it had a great impact on his family, young kids, um, and suddenly the in some ways the problem is gone, but the problems left in the wake is really hard for the rest of the family to deal with. They got to pick up the pieces and try to move on. Um, and addiction can affect the kids. <clears throat> um, well, let's imagine a situation where they've got planning in place. The trustee charged with overseeing the inheritance of the addict may quit because the addict just harasses them. They'll call them at sometimes all hours. They'll beg them, hey, I need money for this. I need money for that. And they'll just generally harass the people who are trying to help them to the point that they don't want to help anymore. Um, the addict wreaks havoc and 
care facilities. They steal from parents, grandparents, other families. They argue with facility and staff. They're belligerent. They look for drugs in the facility. Actually, know of a case where uh, the person was actually going up and asking for, hey, can I get some quaaludes or whatever? And um, just, <laughs> I've never been involved in any of that. And I didn't grow up in a family uh, where we had that in my immediate family. You had to go to the distant family before we had a couple of drug addicts amongst cousins. But, you know, they didn't have a big impact on my life, but I sure saw the effect they had on others. Um, we had one of our clients <clears throat> had gone to the hospital to visit a loved one and they actually observed a hospital employee selling drugs and basically um, took drugs out to somebody who showed up and when they reported it they were told that happens all the time and there's really just no way to stop it. Um, when the addict is incorporate uh, is incarcerated, um, they might end up owing restitution. They might have pending lawsuits. Um, the case becoming public can be a heyday for that person's creditors. Um, it's going to be very disruptive economically to the rest of the family. When an estate is probated, the, the state can recover for the cost of incarceration. And it's expensive um, having somebody in prison. Um, I don't know what it is these days, but they used to say it was $40,000 a year to keep a prisoner. Well, this is also a problem for an addict that's inheriting. They inherit money, but they've got lawsuits. They've got money that's going to be lost to the state. Um, <clears throat> And when that addict dies, his or her estate goes through probate and the state and all those other creditors get another bite at the apple, further disrupting what could have been left uh, to the surviving family. Well, there, uh, there are some resources. There's a tool out there that we use a lot of called the Heritage Trust. Um, it can leave it to really both good people and addicts would benefit from it. Um, but creditors can't take it. The state can't take it. Um, but you kind of have to match the personality to the issue. Sometimes people are in need of a permanent guardianship. They're never going to be able to manage themselves. Sometimes that's uh, an addict. Sometimes it's just somebody who's got um, more disabilities. Um, Therapy can work in some cases, but really a team approach works best. Uh, several different people working together, the family working with therapists and medical people. And, you know, I mean, I hate to use the expression, it takes a village, but for some of these people, it really does. It takes multiple people around them. Um, there can be treatment programs, of course. Um, <clears throat> the solutions need flexibility and options to deal with a changing situation. So you can have an addict that um, they overcome their addiction to alcohol, but <laughs> they replace it with an addiction to gambling, for example. Um, and you have to be ready to deal with their changing situation. Hopefully it'll change for the better. Now, there's three ways you can plan. One is you can give up on them. But the problem with that is people still love their kids. They still want to help them. They don't want to enable them. <clears throat> um, the other thing that you can do is give it to them and let them worry about it. Here it is. Good luck. Sink or swim. Uh, that can be ultimately a terrible way uh, to deal with it. Uh, but so can giving up on them. Well, there might be another way to do it. You can incentivize them, motivate them to participate in a lifetime of recovery. Um, 
we've got language in our documents that allow um, somebody to step in if if there's an addict and take corrective action um, you know get them in some kind of recovery program and basically just not let them have money to go blow um, and one of the things a trustee can do a trustee is going to have way more authority than uh, a court guardian or um, court appointed guardian or an agent under a power of attorney because the trustee owns legal title to the assets and they have a duty to control them. Um, so in plan design, you don't want to do something that aids their addiction. You don't want them to be homeless or without food or shelter and without a phone. Um, they, they need some way to get in touch with people or people to get in touch with them. But you don't want them to harm others or themselves, like family, um, sometimes a third party, like drunk driving or committing a crime. Um, you you want to try to help them avoid those kinds of problems. Well, those administrative dragons, here's how we deal with them. We have six key medical documents. Um, real quickly, I'm just going to in the interest of time, give you a quick list and say that they all work together. And we recommend a company called DocuBank, which keeps these documents on file 24 seven, 365. They can get these documents to a hospital where people need them. Um, having all these documents is great, but if you're in an accident, how do they get to the hospital? DocuBank can fix that. Um, dealing with incapacity, well, there's powers of attorney. In a power of attorney, the principal gives the agent a power of attorney. It's an invitation to third parties to let the agent act on their behalf. But like any other invitation, there's two things you can do with it. You can accept it or reject it. There's a lot of reasons why institutions reject powers of attorney. It's very frustrating for people to deal with. But when we explain to them why, uh, they'll understand it. Um, then there's guardianship, which we define as the court supervised management of assets for somebody who's died. I'm, I'm sorry, for somebody who's incompetent. And it's sometimes called living probate. And then there's a living trust. Um, it can replace the powers of attorney, provides the necessary substitute signature that you need to deal with assets, can avoid guardianships and probate, and it can even provide instructions for an incapacitated trust maker's care. Now, guardianship and probate are caused by the same problem. Um, the problem is a person is unable to sign necessary documents to manage or transfer assets. Well, guardianship and probate solve the problem by having a judge authorize a substitute signature. They are frequently a solution and unfortunately sometimes the only solution to the problem. But are they the best solutions to the problem? Well, guardianship, I could spend a long time talking about this, but basically the minimum cost is gonna be $9,500 to $30,000 or more initially. The annual cost is going to be 2,500 minimum, and that's in a small case. Um, it can be a whole lot more depending on what is involved. It seems like there's a constant stream of surprises. It goes on for as long as the ward is alive. When a person is determined by the court to be incapacitated, they become a ward of the court and the guardian manages their assets. Um, guardianship is disastrous for otherwise good estate planning. Uh, it's really bad for business and it's bad for asset protection planning. It leads to a lot of time. It can take months to get in place. It costs a lot of money. You're going to have to have at least two lawyers and a doctor and a social study. And the cost of all of that comes out of the estate. And by the way, it's cheaper to go see a doctor than it is to get them to write a report for guardianship. <clears throat> um, 
Usually it's going to take multiple hearings, all of them with at least two lawyers. Uh, it depends on what else comes up in that case. And we deal with guardianship a lot. Um, I'm glad that we have other people in the firm so I don't have to do it. <laughs> but there's a loss of control. The family does not control and the ward has no control. Um, and dignity, um, loss of dignity. It's difficult to go say in open court, dad is incompetent. He can't control bodily functions. He can't do a lot of things. I mean, it's just embarrassing. And often you're not the only group in the courtroom. So it's, you know, maybe people who are strangers, but it's still not fun. And it's a major asset protection problem. It opens the door for creditors and predators that would otherwise be shut. So in guardianship, the issue is if a person becomes incapacitated and they individually own assets or they're a joint owner on any assets with someone else, then we go to probate court to do a guardianship of the estate, which can be very difficult, or of the person, which can be easier. Now, is that a good plan B when the guardianship fails? Most people don't think so. What's an alternative? Well, a trust. Now, the person is still going to become incapacitated, but look at how the rules are different. The trustee has legal title to the assets, way more authority than a guardian under the court supervision or an agent under a power of attorney. And they, the successor trustee manages, you can have incapacity instructions. Um, don't think I've got time to talk about that today, but life is a whole lot easier when you've got instructions in there that tell you how to take care of somebody. Everybody says, I want to take care of, I want to be taken care of, but what does that mean? Without written instructions, nobody knows. Then when a person dies, everything goes through what I call the estate settlement cost funnel. There's four types of expenses that come out. The first one is administrative. And when I think of these issues, uh, everybody is going to deal with administrative issues. And to me, it raises three questions which administrative rules apply, how many different rules apply, and where do you put your family in this process? Then there's probate. Um, now, notice that probate is in red, administrative is in green. That's because you can plan to avoid probate. And it works well when you're able to avoid it. Creditors, you can frequently either not have creditors, hopefully, or you can plan around them getting involved in the estate settlement process. And then there are taxes. And outside the scope today, if you have to file an estate tax return, know that it's going to take way more time and administrative costs are going to increase considerably. Um, but you can frequently plan around that. Now, there are only five ways that assets pass on death. And they come, there's two in one box, as I'll show you. But you're going to read these from left to right. So when a person dies, the very first thing we look at is did they own assets with right of survivorship? If so, it passes directly to an individual. If it doesn't pass by right of survivorship, we ask, is there a beneficiary designation or a transfer on death designation? <clears throat> I call that planning by the box. I call it that because there's a box on the form that says, what do you want to have happen to the assets when something happens to you? Well, a lot of people will say, it, just put a person's name down and it'll pass directly to that person. Here's the problem um, with right of survivorship, beneficiary designations and TODs, you're going to lose control and you're going to blow any tax planning you may have done. If it doesn't pass by retirement, I'm sorry, by TOD or beneficiary designation, we ask, is it owned by trust? If so, 
it passes according to the trust terms. If it isn't owned by a trust, there's only one thing left. It goes to an individual and it goes through probate. And there it's controlled by their will or intestate succession. Intestate succession is the will our state legislature wrote for people who either didn't write a will or their will isn't valid. Now let's go back to the box. You can name the trust in the box and change the rules considerably. If you have to go through probate, but you've got a trust-based plan, your will will pay the assets to the trust. And then in the box, the default is that it goes to the probate estate, or sometimes people will name the probate estate in the box. Uh, they don't call it the probate estate, they just say the estate, but that's the probate estate. All of these get assets to beneficiaries, but they're not equal in the way they do it. So we're now gonna take a look at the administrative rules. Right of survivorship, beneficiary designations, and TODs have one common set of rules. But before we get there, in administration, you always have to deal with case law, banking regs, the Internal Revenue Code, and the Treasury regulations. Well, now, uh, these two have one common set of rules. <clears throat> In each state where you have owners, survivors, beneficiaries, or where assets are located, you have uh, various rules that come into play. You should note that the Internal Revenue Code has special bad tax rules that apply to those ways of passing assets. Then there are other laws like the estates or the probate code, the property code, the insurance code, and the family code. If it's owned by a trust, you have one set of rules. It's a Texas trust, typically the Texas trust code. You don't have multiple different laws from multiple different states. Then if it passes individually, you're going to go through probate in each state where there is a real property interest. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. A real property interest in Texas includes mineral interest, but in some states, that's a personal property interest. Um, but I always tell people, if you have to go through probate in two states, you're going to feel like you two, hired two lawyers for the price of three. Their job is similar, but they can't really help each other. Now, um, overusing right of survivorship and beneficiary designation, <clears throat> It's amazing to me how many people use these, and I can only think it's out of ignorance. Uh, they just way overuse it instead of considering other their planning tools. Now, probate <clears throat> technically means to prove up the will, but I like the layman's definition better. It's a court supervised transfer of assets for someone who has died. Um, people want to know two things. How much does probate cost and how long does it take? We get those questions all the time. And I tell people, if you call a law firm and you ask those questions and they give you a straight answer to either one of them, they will lie to you about other things too, because it isn't possible to know. And I'll show you why. What you should ask is who gets paid first and who controls the process. So under our state's code, <clears throat> um, funeral and last illness up to $15,000 each if the court approves. Now, if you're reading a statute and you see something, if the court approves, here's what that means. Lawyers go to court and ask the court to approve it. That's an expensive way to get approval. Family allowance for up to one year if uh, there's qualifying family members. Um, and I'll not talk about who those are, generally spouses and competent adult kids and children, but that's all I'll say about it. Then comes the cost of administration, attorney's fees, court costs, executor, um, that kind of thing. Now, I have a friend who's a funeral director, and he was looking at this one time. He said, see, our lobby is even stronger in the legislature than yours is. We're ahead of the attorneys. And I explained to him, no, we just let you think that because we don't have to take a case until we've been paid. So <laughs> lawyers are really number one on the list. 
then secured claims and tax liens, unpaid child support and interest, taxes, penalties, and interest. Wow, I hear y'all cheering out there. Yes, that's the IRS. They're number six on the list in Texas. Then comes the cost of confinement. Now, think about the addict, been in jail, been in prison. The state can recover the cost of their confinement. Repayment of medical assistance like Medicaid, um, and then any other claims that are generally unsecured. And I, I've got one little short story here where a man uh, rented out a rental home and six weeks after he signed the contract, he died. Well, the renter told the family, hey, I can't pay John Doe. He's not alive. I'll pay the estate of John Doe. Well, the family came to us and they hired us to do the probate. And it was one of those cases where a lot of things went wrong and we did not get an executor appointed until two weeks before the one year lease was up. In other words, it took 10 months. And that, <clears throat> while that's uncommon, it does happen. Well, the renter at that point then paid them all of the back rent. But think about the kids. They had to pay for repairs. They had to pay insurance. They had to pay taxes, all without any revenue coming in. That is poor planning. Now, did you notice who is not on the list? I have an audience here. <laughs> did you notice who's not on the list? The family. Oh, Creditors I, are I'm sorry. right up here. We didn't practice this ahead of time. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. I should have told her what to say there. Anyway, <laughs> family. Um, family. They're the last on this list. They don't get paid anything until all of these people have been taken care of. Now, here's the problem. That gives you the order. But who controls the process? Well, the process is controlled by those people who are going to make claims. There's no way to know how many people will make claims. There's no way to know what kind of claims there will be. A lot of times claims of any kind are a surprise to the family. You don't know once a claim has been made, how long will it take to resolve it? What will it cost? Um, and I've seen um, cases sometimes go on for years before the family could get it because of dealing with claims. Now that's unusual, but it does happen. So I'm going to give you my definition of probate. And I've asked two probate judges about this and neither one of them disagrees with me. Probate is a lawsuit you file against yourself at your own expense to protect your disgruntled heirs, your creditors and your future lawsuit predators. In my 30 years of practice, nobody has ever told me they wanted to protect any one of those three people. Now, we'll talk about predator dragons. Um, defining asset protection to us, protecting and preserving assets from unnecessary loss. Um, and there could actually be a lot of forms of asset protection, but predator dragons, um, here's a shocking statement. Some of you are gonna be surprised. The biggest risk to your estate plan is your child's spouse's divorce lawyer. They can do more things to disrupt uh, the estate plan for your kid than you can possibly imagine. Um, then there can be beneficiary debts. Well, think about that. If your child has debts and they inherit from you and their creditor gets it, is that what you want? Um, well, think about a case like this. <clears throat> a lady I know about two and a half years ago, um, she stepped up on a one step stool to put something in her cabinet, but she slipped. She fell. She broke her leg. She was in the hospital for 12 days. She ran up a $325,000 hospital bill. That didn't count doctor bills. She's been through surgery twice. She's been through rehab twice. I have no idea what that cost. But if her parents left her money and they leave it to her outright, guess what? She may not benefit from it. 
it may all go to pay medical bills. Then there can be predator threats, uh, future lawsuits. Does a beneficiary have a high risk lawsuit job? Um, if they're a surgeon or they're a business owner, depends on what they do for a living. But we always ask, what do the kids do? What do the kids spouses do? Because if there's a high lawsuit risk job, we need to know about it so we can plan around it. What state does the beneficiary live in? Um, that makes a huge difference. Texas is a very good state for asset protection. Um, but a lot of states aren't, and I won't mention any in particular, but California is horrible at this. Um, so how would the loss of those inherited assets affect your beneficiaries? Well, maybe way more than you imagine. Now, when the beneficiary receives it, you have choices. Um, you can <clears throat> pay it outright to the kids. And that sounds nice, I'll give them control, but they don't have any protection from lawsuits. They don't have any protection from guardianship if they become incapacitated and upon their death, it's gonna go through probate unless they do planning to avoid it. You can use a convenience trust. Now that offers some limited protection. It does make it the child's separate property. Um, it does protect from guardianship and probate. It may even protect against the kid's bad money management and the IRS uh, for state tax. All of those are good things, but I'm gonna show you a case here in a minute. You'll see it's not enough. Then there's what we call a heritage trust. <clears throat> it fully protects from creditor and lawsuit beneficiaries, bad marriages, first death in marriage, loss of government benefits. Uh, it can go into a dynasty trust, pardon me, so that it's exempt from a state tax in Texas for over 300 years from the death of your kids, 300 years into the future. And I'm telling clients I'm gonna retire after a couple of hundred years, so I won't be around <laughs> for that, but <clears throat> anyway. Um, Carrie was a young lady who inherited $3 million from her parents, and she was uh, a responsible young lady. And the attorney who crafted that plan started with $3 million to work with and an exemption of only $600,000 for the couple and passed all of it to Carrie, estate tax free. Well, then he shared this horror story. Carrie was in Massachusetts. She was in a car accident where somebody tried to go around her at an intersection, clipped her bumper, caused her to veer off. She T-boned a van load of daycare kids and it killed a driver and two kids. Well, there was a huge lawsuit after that accident. And I worked for personal injury lawyers going through law school and I can tell you their philosophy, sue them all, let God sort them out. Carrie got sued along with the guy who hit her. Well, the case went to trial. The jury came back with a $9.8 million judgment and they found Carrie 10% liable. Now, how much does she have to pay? If you guess $980,000, you can do math, but you're not familiar with the law. <laughs> um, because of something called joint and several liability, and Massachusetts is a pure joint and several liability state, if you're 1% liable, you can pay 100% of the claim. Carrie lost her entire inheritance. This guy asked in a group of me and five other lawyers in the room in addition to him, is there anything else we could have done? Well, I thought I gave a pretty good answer. I said, yes, the question is, did it make sense at the time? But my mentor shared this story. It's a story of Ted who got a little bit too much elbow exercise one night and he failed to negotiate the bridge over the Chappaquiddick River in 1969 and Mary Jo Kopechny died. Well, the Kennedy family had passed down an inheritance to him that's in what we call a heritage trust. The Kopechny family couldn't touch it. So here's Carrie 
10% liable, lost everything. Ted's 100% liable and lost nothing. Wow. Um, do you think it's worth considering protecting your beneficiaries? Well, that's why we ask what they do for a living. What state do they live in? Um, what kind of protection would they have in that state when they get that inheritance? Or if you can leave it in a heritage trust under Texas law, it'll be under Texas law regardless of what state they live on. The creditors won't be able to take it. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you can have in the Heritage Trust asset to provide care, treatment, maintenance, and support and testing for those who are addicted to something. Um, and the trustee can protect and preserve those assets. And that away for that person's lifetime of recovery. Um, and the hope is that you can strive and help them thrive and they'll uh, do well. So Heritage Trust Protection is a great way to plan for um, somebody who's addicted in the family. Now, here's how we go about planning. Um, we analyze the family situation, the financial situation. We help clients figure out what their goals and objectives are. Um, I, uh, I see somebody's asking a question that I will answer here in a minute. You analyze the specific estate planning tools and considering your family situation, financial situation, and specific goals and objectives. Um, you have to consider what you're trying to protect, from whom you are trying to protect it, and what tools might work in your case. Every case is different. Now, I saw somebody ask a question about how do you deal with bank accounts and a trust? Um, I'm going to just share this quick story with you. My brother and I are co-trustees for each other on each other's heritage trust. And about a little over three years ago, uh, my brother changed banks. So I went, we went down to San Antonio and I went to the bank and the bank officer said to me, Mr. Hogue, I'm glad you were able to come in because if anything happened to your brother, you wouldn't be able to access this account. And I said, well, are you telling me that your institution would not deal with a person who holds legal title to those assets? And he got this funny look on his face and he goes, no, of course we would. And I smiled at him and said, I'm here for your convenience, not mine. I could still access that account, even though I haven't signed your account card. That's the power of a trust. Um, now, before planning, basically you just got your stuff sitting in a bag and your estate is at risk and the dragons are going to come. You don't know how many there will be necessarily, though we know we're going to have a big ugly green one. But things being the way they are in the U.S., eventually something's going to go wrong and you're going to have to um, give up those assets. And that's a shame. Well, here's what planning does. You have your assets. Basically, we can build a castle and you can go live in that castle. The dragons will still come, but they can't get into the castle and we have a night to fight them off. Um, so, um, Okay, we got a question here. Do you have to live in Texas and the house be in Texas to use a Texas Heritage Trust? The answer to that is no. Um, now, the house in Texas, um, if it's a homestead, does have a different set of rules than other states have, but the Texas Heritage Trust works the same all over the country. And, um, it's going to be by Texas rules, not by, um, you know, Massachusetts or California or whatever. Um, so, <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, putting TODs on the account, somebody's asking about that. 
it's not as good an idea as having it owned by a trust. The trust is going to control it. I didn't take time to share a lot of case histories, um, but I could share one with you where, you know, son got stuffed by TOD and beneficiary designations. And 10 days after his mom died, he died. He was in a second marriage. The plan didn't go by mom's plan. It went by his plan. And he had a new wife. He had a simple will that went, everything went to her. Nothing went to his minor children. Very sad. That's the danger of TOD, right of survivorship, beneficiary designations, and giving it directly to individuals. Um, okay, Rex, there's lots of questions here. Okay. So, but, but, all right. Marty, do you want to jump jump right into the questions or do we want to do the CEU thing first? Um, the, the, the jump into questions, but right, right at, at 1130, we'll do the CEU stuff. So go ahead. Okay. Just have a couple minutes first. Okay. First off, the first question is for Rana. Okay. Okay. And this is from Janet. And I'm looking forward to hearing your answer to this one myself. <laughs> I what is the, better than the test he gave me. Go ahead. <laughs> what is the root cause for addiction? Is it social identity or is that more in play during addiction after they're out of control? That's a great question. And I think there's a million answers. Um, I believe that there is a genetic component. I believe as Rex talked, there's a lot of times uh, some sort of trauma in the background I believe it's also um, a continued sense of isolation. And all of those things put together, a lot of times will make someone feel helpless and hopeless, and that's their only answer. Okay. All right, Rex, now. The first question, uh let me see is i know it's from nicole but i'm trying to get to the original part of it here is there any way to get power of attorney on an elderly parent who is still addicted what would be that process <clears throat> power of attorney yes uh, being addicted does not make them a ward of the court but if they're able to sign documents and willing to you can get a power of attorney even better, you could get them to do a trust plan where you have way more options if that power of attorney fails. <clears throat> so here's why powers of attorney fail, folks. The bank is supposed to protect your assets, but when you come in, when somebody comes in with your power of attorney, you're not there. You're not there to tell them it's okay to take it. Well, if that power of attorney has been revoked, they have no way of knowing that. Mm -hmm. If they let the agent take out money with the power of attorney. After it's been revoked, the bank has to put that money back in the account. They don't know if you're still alive. If you died, that power of attorney died when you did. Um, and they may be worried about fraud, duress, or forgery. Uh, there's a lot of complications with institutions taking powers of attorney, so they frequently fail. Now, Maureen asked, now this is, I'm going to read this. My sibling is an active addict with mental illness diagnosis as well, which they call this dual diagnosis, Maureen. Uh, my parents have changed their will to have a trust account set up for that sibling's portion of the inheritance with me as a trustee. My non-addict sibling is afraid that all of the unpaid medical bills the addict sibling has can come after the addict share of inheritance. Can you speak to that, please? Obviously, I haven't seen the will or know how that's set up, but we've dealt with situations like that. Uh, if the parents would set up a trust uh, through somebody like us, we know how to get it so that that one child uh, who's addicted won't have a negative impact on the other kids more than just, I mean, at least not financially and legally. Um, it's always disruptive for the family, of course. And she says, oh, go ahead, Marty. I'm sorry. It's, it's, um, it's 1130. So let's, if we could jump and okay. go over the CU real quick and then we'll come back 
to questions sure. if you guys are okay with that. I, yes. I just know some people will have to get off. Right, right. Okay. okay. Um, yes, uh, back because I have so many CEU questions. Marty is going to send a follow-up to the CEU, like he always does. And it will have two forms in there. It will have a sign-in sheet and an eval form. Please fill those out. Send them to me, Sheila at Heyman Hogue, and I will send you your certificate. Just that and simple. In, in addition to the um, two forms that I'm going to send out for, she, for Sheila, and again, you're going to need to complete those forms if you want CEUs today. Um, I need to note, number one, that the CLEs um, today were not no, we are not able to provide CLEs for today. I know we mentioned that up front. I apologize. That was on the flyer. That's that was my, my fault. fault. So don't don't blame anybody but me. <laughs> it's all right. And so, um, but if you could also complete the Google um, survey, you should have the opportunity to go to that as you as you um, close out a Zoom today. If you don't get it, then you will also receive a link to that in the follow up email. That helps us uh, report back on the goals and objectives we set forth when we applied for the grant funding to um, to put on these webinars. Uh, one of the things that I must say, we are funded um, um, through state and government money. So I've got to say that um, Heyman Ho, um, and both attorneys are, are on today are do this work, and but there's also other attorneys out there. And I have to make sure that, that, that I say that this is for educational purposes. Um, it's, it, it's, it's not to sell, but you're more than welcome to call the, the, the speakers and, and ask them their questions, you can use them. Um, that's up to you, but there's also other attorneys out there that, that do this work. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you for questions and answers. How's that? Okay, in addition to the last question that you answered for Maureen, she, she gave you some more information to say, thank you. It is a lot of unpaid medical bills and the addict sibling is on disability for the last 14 years with legitimate physical and mental disabilities. So you can see where the other sibling would say, wait a minute, you know, I don't care. And and I, Maureen is just hitting the tip of the iceberg because those of us who've had an addict in the family know these bills are outrageous. And I there is no, so, but Rex did the best he could to answer that Maureen. And I'm so sorry, but that's that's the way it works. Yeah, and I saw a question in there about uh, Texas isn't the only state with a heritage trust. Every state has some form of it. Yeah. Um, we have colleagues all over the country, and I helped one of my California colleagues craft a heritage trust that would work for Texas law. Their trust doesn't work well under Texas law, but they had a beneficiary in Texas, and I helped him do that. But every state has some form of that. And a heritage trust is our terminology. It's what we call it. <clears throat> but they're available everywhere. And we know attorneys in virtually every state who know how to do them. So we're part of Wealth Council, over 5,000 members in our network. All right. Nicole was trying to help Maureen and say that perhaps it, something similar to a special needs trust could help. Could you address that, Rex? Uh, yes, and under Texas law, we can use the Heritage Trust <clears throat> in lieu of a special needs trust, but we usually do both because if that special needs person moves to another state and there's some administrative advantage to having that trust in another state, we want the special needs trust to apply in that other state. It does work differently in every state but yes, a special needs trust can do the same thing, though the heritage trust is typically more flexible um, and less restrictive. Okay, Nicole needs to know if she takes the TOD off, then it will revert to her trust request? If she has a trust and she puts the account in the name of the trust, then yes, you don't need the TOD anymore. Okay. All right, now let's back to over here. What is the benefit of an irrevocable trust? Is it better than a dynasty trust? A dynasty trust is one form of an irrevocable trust. Um, 
Dynasty trust just means it keeps going for generations. Uh, that 300 year rule in Texas, that's a dynasty trust. Um, and we use both revocable and irrevocable. They, they serve different purposes. Um, the average person needs a revocable trust, one that they can change. Irrevocable trusts, we use them in asset protection planning, um, gift and state tax planning. We use them in situations where you've got an addict. Maybe mom and dad want to leave an irrevocable trust to the addict or an injured child or uh, maybe a child that's just their special needs are not addicted to anything. But um, there is a, there's a lot of uses for both. But the revocable trust is more common. Oh, Bernice, I'm so sorry. Bernice has got to jump off. She's taking her husband to the emergency room. I'm so sorry, Bernice. Uh, very sorry Thank you me. for joining us this morning. Um, okay, are there any more questions? I think <clears throat> that I've, I think I got them all, but. Uh, did you get the Q&A too? I, I, I think so. I okay. thought I did. Well, I, I, I can just say that if, if someone um, needs a multi-generational dynasty trust, then I need adopting. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't leave me out. I was going to say. Uh, I just had to throw I'll that in. That Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but once again, thank you all. Seriously, it was just really, really very, very good information. Great stuff. Um, we certainly appreciate it. Um, all of you and um and do you guys have anything else you want to say before we close out or say goodbye uh, i just really appreciate the opportunity um, yeah I see somebody asking about our contact information i will go backwards one slide yeah perfect if you've got and, a chance to put that down and 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 i'll have both contact information both of your contact information in the in the follow-up email um, with links to your to your um, to your respective companies. I, I put that in all of the uh, follow-up emails um, um, in case anybody wants to reach out to one of the presenters. And we do have an Arlington and Frisco office. Oh yes, somebody did also ask work that. all over the state. So okay. Okay. okay how, uh, yeah. How uh, somebody did, there was, I must have just flew right over that, but someone did ask about that. And our Arlington location is on Lamar. Uh, but if we do have that, and like Marty said, there's just get someone that knows what they're doing. So not a, um, you know, a bankruptcy lawyer or a um, I, you know, a man that says he can do everything. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't do that. So, um, but I, yes, I did, for, I did fail to mention that Rex. Thank you for bringing that up. So, okay. So we will, um, we will, um, get that information to you all again, the contact information for the speakers presenters will be in the uh, follow-up email, but thank you all so much for, for, um, for today's presentation. It was excellent. And thank you all for joining us. We certainly appreciate it. Y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.